This is Weaving the World Operations, Wednesday, October 13th, 2021. <clears throat> and then she'll come home and then she's got a panel discussion a little bit later uh, for the same, they're doing kind of a, a show on the future of work. Oh. And she's involved, it's really kind of cool. So she got up, she got up really early and you know, all the prep and all that. Um, cool, thank you for being here. I'm, there are a bunch of things that are, that are pressing for weaving the world. So I was hoping to uh, pick your brains and see if we can't make some decisions uh, together. Um, among which are, what are the first episodes going to be and when is the first show? And what is the rhythm and what do we call this thing and things like that, which I've got ideas on, but I would just love to, to kick them around. Um, and one of my logistics problems is that next week, which is when I'd like to have the first show, is a weirdly like three different events are overlapping next week. And I have a whole bunch of other things I'm supposed to do. Uh, so the timing is not fabulous for starting this thing next week, but I would actually like to have a show under my belt. Uh, and... and uh, it's funny, and I'm thinking here when I say a show, do I mean just the episode, or do I mean the episode and its shadow, or a post show, or you know all that kind of stuff? Uh, and I think that I think our nomenclature here, just like sorting out nomenclature that that feels good, would be a big uh, good step forward. Uh, so let me just stop for a second, see what what thoughts you all are having. I let Bentley go first. <laughs> Um, I had two thoughts before the thoughts that you brought up was um, I have the feeling that this project may need a project manager slash producer because I think Jerry you said that that's not your favorite tasks not a um, forte yeah and so and then uh, the other thing I thought of is I know that you're working with someone about doing a logo so i'd like to hear bar progress on that but i think in addition to that you need an icon that you know can be like the, the little thing on the browser and for you know if you ever do merch merch or something then you know it needs to be something that can be black and white and be stitched um, a vector graphic so and that should probably be derived from uh, anything else but i did actually have the same concept of a woven globe mm -hmm. um I, the interesting thing is also kind of maybe keeping it open and slightly unfinished but somehow not make it look like the second death star good um, point would be exactly kind of, yeah exactly the at&t logo right yeah yeah which was a death star appropriately um <laughs> but you're you're totally thinking the way i'm thinking right right so like, those are, those are the topics that kind of bubbled up um someone to kind of like uh corral the cats um and then to your points yeah i think uh, yeah i don't know if next week even recording a show i like the concept of show i think we just think of it like a tv show that's given out to the web um because it is fairly high produced serialized well not serialized but highly produced content uh within a, a reasonable set period of time i think it fits show terminology mm -hmm. i think that's all i have it that yeah i think that's everything um thanks when i when i google woven earth doesn't yield much but woven globe yields a, a bunch of things and i'm thinking of some some uh, sort of a, a whimsical globe would be pretty funny and we need to decide the problem with the globe is that you can't show all the continents so you either tend to be one hemisphere or specific right. So which, um, which side is facing you? Yeah. Or just people on, uh, the interesting thing about using a, a woven globe is that it gives the concept of longitude and latitude lines. So you, you, they kind of know it's a globe even if you don't have continents. And then that frees up the center to be anything using different yeah. colors or, so those are some thoughts. Yeah, uh, there's also possibly, like I could unfold the globe into a Dimaxion projection or something like that, which would then be a textile in the shape of Dimaxion map uh which would be interesting uh mm -hmm. flatter but I, I like the round um and uh, melina bishop is the textile artist who's sort of laid aside her textile art to, to make a living uh but we're talking and we've been having trouble actually finding a time to coordinate uh, but she's got actual analog materials that we can photograph or whatever that might be interested in crafting something new don't know 
Um, yeah, that'd be uh, fabulous. Yeah, it'd be really, it'd be really, really interesting uh, to have sort of original art around this. And then I think um, I need to figure out what the sort of canonical set of images is because you know, fave icon is also a like a sixteen by sixteen square pixel art, or maybe it's sixty four by sixty four square pixel art that is a podcast logo because they all have to be the same size mm -hmm. and, and the same pixel size. Uh, and then a banner, you know, banner art and a couple other sorts of things all need to kind of fit in the same in the same general theme yeah i mean you actually need everything from 16 by 16 to 64 by 64 and that's just for the the icon the fev icon the, the 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 logo piece for the um podcast there's like two or three sizes and stuff like that so there's a there's a lot and you'll want something that can go all those different well it doesn't all have to go all those scales. At the bigger part, you'd want to use the high fidelity stuff, just as long as it resembles the logo. I am uh, I call it logo, but obviously people have different opinions on that. I'm so icon mm -hmm. can either appear on or just resemble enough of that, you know, of the act of a photo that you could use the photo and the bigger stuff and the icon and the smaller stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I can, I can kind of help out with that stuff. Well, thank you. And also like as you, the images could kind of zoom in on parts. So, so the larger, when there's more space like a banner, it could be the full globe sort of uh, partly done, but at smaller scales, it could be a close up of a of, of piece of the weaving, just that that shows the spherical sort of nature a little yeah. bit, but then shows like, hey, this is, this is open territory. This is where, because what's interesting is kind of the frontiers of where the weaving is happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's all interesting, but but that's metaphorically like the, the juicy part. It's like, where do we connect stuff here and there? Also interesting is if different kinds of fabric are being woven together, if different, right. if different textures are meeting, if it's a collage of fabrics. So rather than a woven globe of one material that happens to have continents, uh, instead, if the continents are figurative and uh, different kinds of textile, that gets really interesting uh, here as well, because then we make our point better, I think. And then uh, one thing to think about is whether you have a preference or do them both an open weave, which I was looking at, which so the there's an actual spacing between the uh, weaves or a, more of a tight weave with wider bands. Um, the open weave might be an interesting metaphor. I like the open weave because you can sort of see the whole sphere and you can get a much better sense of space and depth. Um, Tight weave might be interesting if somebody wanted to do like a cross stitch of the globe or something, right? Like like a uh, you know so, some some crafty version of it that that uh, that is playful but different. Um, yeah, and I think all of those could be useful. We'll still need to figure out which one's kind of the canonical one, um, but all those different visual representations I think would add to the project. Cool. Hi, Hank. Hello. Took me a long while to find the link to get in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I'm a bit late. Uh, it, usually, it's in the channel on Mattermost in the header. Uh, that, that's the, the most solid place to find uh, the links. It was finding the channel on Mattermost. Oh. <laughs> I've switched from Google to DuckDuckGo, mm -hmm. and it shows up on Google, but it doesn't show up in DuckDuckGo. Darn it. At <laughs> least not yet, but I'll fix it. Here so I wait. am. So our Mattermost channels do show up on Google search? Uh, I did find it a couple of times on Google. That's interesting. It takes, it takes a while for you to train Google. Yeah. So, but true. I'm sure it's on there. And I'm sure it's on DuckDuckGo. It's just, I don't think DuckDuckGo knows to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's about training it. I mean, I would recommend not searching for resources that you go to frequently. Uh -huh. So figure out how because, to use the because you on your browser. Because you overexpose them? Use of time. Huh? Because you overexpose them to the search engines or what? No, just because it's uh, they're unreliable. Uh -huh. you're, nope. you're, you're allowing some corporation to decide whether- To be your external memory. Your resource. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, I mean- uh, Your access to your external memory. What, one, of, one of my go-to lines when I talk about Open Global Mind is we, you know, we have outsourced our memories to uh, Wikipedia and Google, and that's a mistake. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and and Doc Searles, who you know was an A-list blogger back when blogging was new, his memory was he would blog everything, and then he would just search Google, and it, Google would point back to his blog because yeah. he was such a popular blogger. Uh, so he he had a fully externalized memory, which which worked only because he was an A-list blogger. 
it's kind of funny. Um, so Hank, we're talking about the visuals for weaving the world and the idea that the kind of the, I think the obvious and compelling image is some kind of globe woven, um, probably still in the process of being woven that as Bentley nicely point out, pointed out, doesn't look like the Death Star or, uh, or you know, the last remains of civilization uh, on a devastated earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've got that little line to walk, um, but and I think a little bit of whimsy would be good too, and a little bit of patchwork or multiple materials meeting would be useful. Uh, you know, maybe instead of continents, so that we don't have the, the question about which continent are we staring at. Do we do the usual Western projection uh, or, or not? You know, and when you yep. go to other parts of the world and you see what maps they put on the wall of their classrooms, you're like, oh, oh, right. I guess you could split the United States in half. <laughs> <laughs> and, and put it at the edges. Um, yeah, I have some interesting visual material on that. There's the, the, when the logo for the United Nations was first designed, it was a Western centric uh, uh, logo. And uh, they got so much commentary on that. The year after, they changed it to a non-Western logo. I'll see if I can get it here into the chat, although it's not, usually I can't upload from my computer in the chat, but uh, I'll, I'll show you that. And I'll show you some other interesting projections. Sweet. Flag of the United Nations, gold. Oh, so, so the current logo is a polar projection. Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. One one year after it started, they decided that was the way to go. Yeah, smart. Yeah, very. I, I, I searched originally UN logo, and I don't have anything that looks controversial. I only have the, the current one. Um, uh, I'll get you a, a slide of it. Well, there's 1946 version, huh? Let's see what this is. Uh, no, none of these look, well, that one might, might be what happened. Uh, let's see, um, let me go back to screen share <clears throat> and go here. So this one on the right, uh, looks yep. like it's got North America flat yep. in, the, in, in the middle. That's probably yep. the original logo. Yes. Yes. Yep. Cool. Thank you for the story. That uh, did not know that. Makes a lot of sense. And there's a there's a Dimaxion projection for you. Thank you. Well done. As a, as a possibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I've always I've always wondered why Dimaxion isn't more popular because it seems to me like unrolling triangles makes a lot of sense for normalizing stuff. But then once you get into reading about projections, it's a crazy deep, difficult topic. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Buckminster Fuller's writing is really for. Uh, uh, for the dedicated. <laughs> well, I don't even mean his, I don't even mean his writings about Dimaxion. I mean, you know, cartography itself, the, the, all the various projections and oh, which yeah. one and yeah, how yeah. Th there's actually a measure for the goodness of a projection. There's yeah. a. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, hold on. There we go. Let me share screen again. Boop. So here's uh, map projections. Yeah. Uh, and so there's the orthograph as a muffle equidistant, Cahill butterfly map, Gall Peters, Cahill keys. Uh, general perspective projection is a, is a whole category of projections. So is myriahedral. And I'm looking for uh, the measure. Oh, here it is. The Goldberg got error score is uh -huh. the is the measure of how good is a projection, which in part sees whether a, a straight line drawn on the map is more or less a straight line in the real world. Fascinating. I think I think wow. that's one of that's one of the things it's looking for, but I don't I don't remember what else. But I think it didn't have a Wikipedia page at the time I I, I did this. So I'll, that's I'll really interesting. I'll yeah, check again. Never heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, because this because you know mapping is a is a, is a big thing. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing the number of projections people have thought of and how they, how they differ and what they do. Um, 
Cool. Um, and then another way of um, another way of re representing the the globe would be just abstract or conceptual. It didn't wouldn't have to be you know a photo of analog uh, of an analog artifact. It could be just a conceptual thing. So I think we can explore that as well. Uh, that may well be a, a totally useful avenue or inspired by, or even abstracted out from original photos. There's lots of ways of doing this. And it also, for, to start, it doesn't need to be complicated. I think, uh, I think we may go through generations of art uh, and it, it would actually be fun to go through generations of art as we get better at the podcast. And starting with something kind of crufty is no problem for me. I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't mind our first episodes having a home crafted feel. Um, and, and, and they don't need to progress to like looking like they were done by NBC or, you know, CNN, like, like leave, leaving them a feeling uh, more artistic than professional would be totally great. Um, any other thoughts, uh, Stacey? Yeah, I think we should move on to something else because cool. I think the art thing would be good with that woman that you talk, you know, you should be talking to her this way she could show you stuff and um I, I want to go back to Pete's project plan, the, the one that you worked on with Pete, because I looked at that and I was just wondering, like, what was filled out on there? Um, yes. And this is the project plan for the tile, right? No, 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 no. I didn't mean I didn't mean separately. I didn't mean his I didn't mean his piece. I mean, the project plan that we looked at with Hank yesterday. Um, I noticed like there were questions that I, I haven't had them answered. Like, I don't know. Who 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 is the audience? Oh, okay. So you mean uh, the 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 Google Doc? Correct. Correct. Okay, I'll go back. Let me go back to it just so I can refresh. Um, and Hank had put a bunch of questions at the bottom, right? Yeah. Oh, those were Hank's questions. Those oh, were Hank's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, I didn't the, realize that. Okay. Hank, Hank added those questions at the bottom, and I haven't had the time to go back and and look at them. Okay, uh, I apologize. And I thought those were yours, and I was like, well, we should finish it first. Okay, that I was confused. Well, it's actually, um, these are good conversations to, to actually have. Um, yep. So the, the questions that Hank left in are, who's the audience? What is the expected outcome or impact? Uh, communication, uh, by which I think you mean, what are the means? What are the ways that we're communicating? Yeah, how are we going to communicate? How are we going to create a buzz? Do we want to create a buzz? Do we want to remain below the radar? Uh, the, the, all those type of things. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and then Hank even offered a W in maps, <laughs> which is nice. Um, so, so let's, let's, uh, let's actually talk about these for, for a bit, uh, right now. Um, and for me, um, for me, the original, the, the initial audience is sort of people who, who care about repairing the world's problems and who care about sharing what they know about repairing the world's problems. So it's, it's a kind of a, a practical thing. And, and I'm hoping that those people come from a wide variety of kind of disciplines or focal points or areas. Um, let me, um, let me stop the bullet. Actually, let me indent and do it this way. Um, And when I say from different perspectives, I mean, uh, some of these people will be policy wonks who have policy solutions. Some of these people will be uh, trust builders who just want to uh, uh, break bread together with people who think of themselves as others. Uh, some of them will be sociologists who have theories of change that, you know, uh, that map to the kinds of stuff we're working on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Um, does that make sense? Yep. So I think, yeah. Okay. So um, they care about, okay. Cause you left it. Or I typed it in. You said um, people who want to share what they know. And I was just going to point out that's not the audience because the audience isn't sharing the area. The audience is listening. That's true. Although I'm going to immediately encourage people to share what they know in whatever means and send me the links and I'll add them to my brain. And, and we're working toward the big fungus where everybody's sharing anyway. Um, right. So. Um,
Um, and it's not just what they know, it's also um, in the spirit of Hank's positive cartography, uh, it's what they, what they wish for, what they, you know, what are their objectives? What do they, what do they hope we achieve? Uh, all these things kind of woven together. Uh, yep. I, th I think that's a big piece of it. I'm, I'm not interested, I'm sort of, I'm mostly, and this is just sort of my general attitude about this, I'm mostly not interested in us having like millions of views and, and like going crazy with huge audience sizes uh, and, and, and like monetizing YouTube the usual way and trying to make, you know, some money for, for OGM and weaving the world that way. I'm really interested in building an authentic tribe and connecting a community across, you know, bridging across communities. I think one of our early calls needs to be, uh, you know, basically a meeting of communities in yep. some interesting way. Uh, very interested in that. And I kind of want this to feel like you're, you're a participant in the act of fixing the world in some way. That That's like the feeling I want to have. Okay, so the purpose is more on connecting than on getting views. Yes. That's what, okay. That's important to know. That's, that makes a big difference. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, all that said, um, one of the goals of story threading, for example, is to create a, a, a rich enough variety of media that one of them might go viral, right? And, and, uh, and, and if a meme goes viral, that's great because it's doing work in the world by hopefully changing minds or, you know, in its, in its contagion, it affects a lot of people and so forth. That's great. That would be a, a fabulous side benefit. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's got to spell it properly. By the way, um, since you had given me permission, I used that thread to play and I answered those questions for like my dream of dreams on the um, Discord, not Discord, on the Mattermost channel, because I was hoping that it would at least be a place to like brainstorm or think when we're not on camera. Love that. Yep. And, and that and what you did is perfect. And I just haven't caught up with the, the Mattermost this morning yet. <clears throat> um, so I didn't see that. That's great. I didn't know that. Uh, do you want to just riff on these things? Um, well, no, I can't, okay. I, I can't talk this morning. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'll go look at what you've done on the, on the Mattermost. Um, <laughs> okay. um, and do you guys have any other thoughts about this first question? Who else, uh, how else do we define our audience? I'm interested in all ages. I would love it if kids, if young people came in, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to get kids to do stuff. You sort of have to, uh, in some sense, you have to go where they are. Um, yeah. it, also, it also complicates our world because the moment you have kids in videos that you're publishing to YouTube, uh, the, the, the scrutiny goes up, which is, which is terrific, but it, it, I, I don't know exactly what that means and, and, and how to do that, but uh, that's important to, to note. Uh, yeah. and, and it would also be lovely, um, you know, be lovely to have people of all ages and all backgrounds jumping in. Um, uh, maybe just add multi generational. Yeah. And and we'll see how that works out. And um, At some point, and I don't know exactly what this process is or when or where, <clears throat> but at some point, I think also a really, really important part of this project is talking to people who are not thinking uh, the same way as we are, because I think we're relatively homogeneous uh, of point of view in our conversations and groups, which is comforting and a nice tribe. Um, but I think that our work is only making progress is only being effective if we start to communicate with people who don't think like us and yes. yeah and and i think that's a I've, I've got to figure out how to craft that whom to invite how this works where to go all of that yeah there was a, a very sharp uh, uh email two days ago by ken homer on the on the listserv about uh, all white men in a project and where are the women and where are the non-white men and where are the voices of the yet unborn and it's absolutely it's absolutely true 
Yep. I, I, I was on a big call the other day where uh, an older white gentleman who was a very nice guy, uh, he rec his recommendation was, let's just go back to the classics, have everybody learn Latin and Greek and, and go back to the classics. And I'm like, I did like a face palm all by myself, you know, in my little square on Zoom, because like, no, seriously, people, because that, that's basically, the, if only everybody knew the Western canon, we'd all be okay, is not an answer to this question. Yeah. At least it's not a viable answer for me. Um, yeah. I, and, and I would probably agree with this gentleman that we have lost critical thinking, that we, you know, it seems like society is going down the tubes. Uh, and then I would also point out that, and by the way, there are some young people who are way smarter than me. And there's a lot of, like, lot of people doing like phenomenal stuff that's way beyond that. Yeah. So it's just that as a society, we're in this moment where, uh, and my, my thesis for this, my story to thread through it is that we've sort of given up our souls to consumerism. And by being treated as mere consumers, we're stupider than we normally would be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so my, 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 my belief system says that people are generally smart. Uh, you can see it when you scratch on whatever their hobby is. The thing that, you know, if they're passionate about baseball, they can do really sophisticated statistics. They have a memory like nobody's business. They are analytic about the, you know, strategies and staffing and whatnot. I don't, whatever somebody's passion is, you'll be like, wow, they go really deep. It's just that they're not applying it to the world's problems, maybe yeah. because they feel powerless, maybe because they've been treated poorly, maybe because who knows what. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my amateur thesis of, of the dynamics that work there. Um, any other thoughts about audience? Um, if not, let's move to impact. I had a thought about audience. You didn't see yep. my hand. Oh, um, I did not. You're right. I know. Um, and I had put it in. So the idea about bringing together people, other people that were doing this exact same thing, I had put some names in the Google Doc because I think that if we do that first, whether it's part of the show or just pre-show, that's gonna bring a lot of those different voices together. And I did put some names and in terms of the questions that um, Hank had put, the one that I didn't answer was the buzz because I wasn't even sure how I felt about it. But now that I hear what your goal is, um, one of the things that I thought would be interesting is to have people like in the different groups that we're related to, the conversational communities, almost throw forward a name of somebody that you may not have really heard of or realized what they're doing. Like I had somebody, that's who I put in my list that really inspires me, that is different than the group that usually meets here and that brings a lot with her. So mm -hmm. I, I just think that's a good starting point that might accomplish a lot of the goals we talked about. Um, I like that. Uh, and I guess two thoughts on that. One is that um, my goal is not to do a tour of celebrities. Like, like I'm, I'm not interested in sort of big names who will attract an audience kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should go try to book Yuval Harari and uh, yeah. uh, whoever. Like, you know, uh, that, that's not really sort of how I'm looking at this. Uh, and then also, I think some calls, uh, we might shape them, and I'm really interested in playing with the format. Uh, some calls, we might shape them where there's three people talking, and I'm just kind of facilitating, but mostly note-taking. <clears throat> and I'm not really the interlocutor, but someone else is. Yeah. Uh, and, and we move through things, uh, which, would be, which would give me a lot more liberty to actually do the weaving that, that I normally do, which, we, which I would be doing a lot of you know, in the post-show and all of that. Um, but I want to mess with format some so that uh, uh, we have some room for, for, for innovation and, and other sorts of conversation. Okay. But just to be clear, I was talking about people that you would not have heard of. Uh, that, which is, that's that's which, what I'm yeah. specifically talking about. Yeah, yeah. Which is what, I, what, what I'm saying, not celebrities. I mean, let's find interesting people that are suggested by our crowd. Um, when I say panel, I say let's make room for multiple voices who are different. Uh, to, to be in, a, in the same conversation, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm in the same energetic space, I think. So if I can make a suggestion. On Please. A preliminary action to that is to write up a quick sentence or two on what we want and having some place for people to make those suggestions, which is a continuation of, what, of, course, of course what Stacey was saying. Yes. And I think um, the project plan is not a bad place and we're 
and, and where some piece of this winds up getting bigger than needs to fit in the project plan, it can be a separate document. Yeah, we can uh, right? move it out and link to it. Exactly, because because the idea of brainstorming who should, you know, brainstorming the episodes and who should be on an episode is, is its own largish project. And yeah. I created I created a spreadsheet for suggestions on that, but the spreadsheet is not a good place for the conversation. <clears throat> um, so maybe the thing is that we we talk about um, we talk about people on Weaving the World Ops Mattermost channel. That's where we sort of share ideas for for who. And then as we come up with names and, and framings, we put those into the spreadsheet and move those up and down uh, yeah. and turn, turn them into actual episodes. So um, should I take the names? I put a couple of names in the spreadsheet. Should I remove them and put them in? I think, the... putting, them in the, I think putting them in the spreadsheet is a great idea. That's, that's totally fine. Um, and also and, put them in weaving. And, and put them in weaving. Yeah, put them in WTW Ops. Okay. And then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and sort of talk. And um, yeah. Okay seems fine to me. Um, and I think there needs to there sort of somewhere very visibly. I need we need to I need to synthesize how can you help? Like what kinds of things do we need right now? Right now we could use some art help on logo, we could use some music help on a on an intro outro tune. Uh, or something. I don't do an awful lot of music on things that I do, but I really like, you know, most podcasts have some, some interesting music. There's a whole bunch of copyright free music that exists in the world, but choosing it is hard. Like you could, you could waste a whole bunch of time just going through listening to little snippets that people have uploaded. Um, I've got a composer, one of my most eccentric friends is a composer, uh, also who's a, 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 a telecom analyst who lives in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn who would easily compose a, a ditty as well, I think, but uh, we'll see. Um, he's been playing with GarageBand, getting like really good. He, he can make things that sound like 80 people are, are at work making music. It's quite amazing what you can do with GarageBand these days. I don't know if you know this, but I have realized that so many of the people in this group are musicians. Not, I don't mean this four people here, yep. but so many people that I talk to, it always comes up that I'm not, but that they're musicians. And I think that's a real fun thing to play with. Um, I love that. Um, and I think we should play with that more, like, like see what that means. Bentley? Yeah, and kind of to that point, I, I think what might be good also to add to that document is kind of these list of needs that you just listed off. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think we also kind of need to give a, a perspective on what type of, if any, uh, compensation they should be expecting, mm -hmm. um, it, be it equity or, or you know, f promise of future earnings more than equity because um, it's not a profit business. But um, or would there be some there? What you know? Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, Um, so under, let me put under budget compensation as a new section. We'll make it a, <clears throat> these are heading twos. Nope, heading ones. Never mind. Um, and then, um, Let me create another section for needs, which goes right under, I think, the web presence. I think it's like right top. If it's convenient to save me time, if you could paste the link to that, I can go look for it as well. Uh, you bet I can. Of course I can. Um, Lazy web. Yeah, no, I should have done that. I apologize. Not to get ahead of anything, and I know, and it's not, you know, I know you're working, you want to get this first show done, but just projecting a little bit into the future, it would be nice, maybe, and this might be a different group of people working on this, but somebody to be able to chart what connections are made and if any new collaborations result from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a way to follow up. Yeah. And I'm wondering if maybe like somebody like Sam Hahn would be interested, you know, 
you know, he's a friend of mine. We were chatting about this yesterday. And I'm just wondering if, you know, maybe we can start bringing people into things that touch on weaving the world, but become a separate pod. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I like that a lot. And it, it's, it, it triggers lots of different thoughts and we should probably stay on it for a bit. Um, one thought is that, you know, I've, I've been asking Harlan for an RSS feed. I, I gave up, but, but 15 years ago, I was asking for an RSS feed out of the brain so that as I made connections in my brain, somebody could subscribe to them and see what I've added. And he said, I don't see a reason for that feature. And I'm like, <laughs> um, and one of the motivations for having an open source brain is that that would be a, a, an easy thing to add or design in or, or whatever else. Um, but that's just one tiny aspect of what you just said. I mean, an, another piece of it is, um, and maybe this is good, maybe this is bad, I don't know, but, but self-reporting of uh, friendships that have been built because of our connections, uh, self-reporting of uh, projects that are born in these discussions and then turn into something and then turn into an asset or something like that. But, but it's, it's a little bit like um, it, 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 toward the next bullet question, which is what are uh, our out, intended outcomes? Um, you know, uh, what is our expected outcome? I think that if this works well, we become a little star nursery for connections and, and innovations and, and uh, other kinds of things that, that start to fix the world. So I, I, don't, I don't see us as the, as the birthplace. Well, I don't see us as the birthplace of brand new ideas for how to fix the world. I think I see us as the integrators and connectors of other people's fabulous ideas. And, and one of the things that we might get good at is helping two communities realize how much they have in common and suddenly begin cooperating a lot more than they used to or blend in some interesting way. Does that make sense? <clears throat> um, it, it makes sense. Uh, just having been in groups like, like with Sam, whose whole intent is collaboration, mm -hmm. I know the difficulties that are there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, and I think they know these, I think, I think a lot of people want what we're looking to do in terms of that. Um, I guess I'm looking to say, how are we going to measure that? Um, yes, w with the caveat that sometimes there, you don't want to measure some intangibles because you screw them up. You know, so if we have a, if we have a rating system where everybody's contributions get rewarded with some kind of coin that we mint inside of the network, uh, to me, that would probably screw up a lot of the intrinsic reward of participating. Pardon? No, I, I didn't mean that. And I, I know a way more human centered approach. Yeah, you know, exactly. whether it be, you know, some sort of, you know, follow up show or after. The, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just throwing it, it out there. It, it could even be a ritual where we where we're after every episode or something. We sort of check in with the crowd and say, hey, what new connections got made? Like like, uh, you know, uh, what new fabric got woven as a result of these sorts of things but then but then we need people to actually sort of know to report in in that way it needs to be more than just a, a simple question asked it needs to be um, part of our dynamic in some bigger way yeah I mean I know you've mentioned to me before that you know if I you know wanted to do something like correspondency like and, and I was thinking you know I mean again and I don't know that this would be you know aired but I'm thinking that I might want to follow up with the guests after the show and sort of make that human, an additional human connection after it's over and maybe see what happens there with That's whoever awesome. wants to, you know, participate. I mean, I have a couple of people that I think would, you know, maybe it becomes another conversation. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> There's also, um, uh, this is just by example, but there's a process that the military uses that other people use now, also now called the after action review. Yeah. Um, and it basically says, what was this thing trying to do? Uh, did we do it? How could it be made better? And it's not an attempt to lay blame on anybody because what you want is participants to be really open about what happened. Uh, it's a little bit like the writer's workshop process also in that you're, you're really trying to, to make the work better and not critique the author. Um, and so in, in, in the action, you know, after action review, you're basically trying to learn from what, what just happened. And I think we could have our own flavor of kind of post-processing. That's also about, you know, what can we learn about what we just did that would make the whole process better or, and I think you're, you've got a really nice angle on this, which is like, how do we learn about the good connections that got made through the process? Right. 
feeling we're going to find as we go along people that knew each other that didn't know they knew each other mm-hmm. people that knew each other that didn't know that person was involved in that you know that's what i think is going to happen based on just my experience not having to do with film you know with whatever we're filming and that that's what i'm hoping for because that's weaving the world yeah exactly exactly uh, with luck we with luck, people are like, oh, 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 I, I, I knew I meant to meet you, but and here you are, kind of thing. Right. Like, you know, we can bring people in who, who, who are destined to meet and help, help accelerate that destiny somehow. Um, other thoughts on that? What other impact? Let me just go around. What other, um, what other impacts? would are on your wish list for something an artifact a, a series of events like this a, a community with a with an, a thing that lets you know gives us a charter to go go around and ask questions and and build conversations and make connections what else would be good outcomes thank you've been doing this work for a long time what <laughs> what do you wish would come out of it yeah i i wish something i wish that the uh, uh, I'll call it spin-offs. Uh, that there are lots of different spin-offs, uh, which mean that people have met either new people or new ideas have gone away and done something concrete with them. Uh, I'm I'm really the the guy who likes to combine inspiring thoughts and real action in the world. So I could imagine that you meet the right people or suddenly you're, you're, you get a, a, an insight in, into an idea or some thinking that you were never aware of and you say, yeah, I'm gonna take this and do something with it. Love that. <clears throat> and I think that, and what, what's fun is that that doesn't build your central audience. You don't, cause you don't hear about all these spinoffs very often. They just go do yeah. stuff. But that, that's a sign of like a really generative community when, when lots of people are meeting up and creating things and going off and doing them together. Um, I think that's a great idea. I, I mean, in, in, a, in a really great world where, what, what, where this sort of starts working, um, one of my major goals is humans start being able to collaborate on big questions about how to deal with climate change or racism or or immigration or whatever together, together much better than we are now. And we start to melt some of the log jams that exist in the world. And, and you know, right now we're just like a, a, an ant in the great field of, of humanity. We're just kind of moving around trying to do a tiny thing. <clears throat> but if we do this right um, and it's contagious and we model it well and we offer resources and all of that, um, I, uh, I, my, goal, my goal is, because um, when, when we get on the Thursday calls and Doug, Carmichael says, hey, the house is on fire again, you know, many weeks. And like, how do we get people to wake up and go do stuff? And when Greta Thunberg stands up and says, you all are failing us, they're right. And, 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 and my approach to that problem is that there's a, a, a huge breach and lack of trust. And the, the, this lack of trust has us in, in lockups worldwide on all these issues. And we are unable to make progress. You know, the Biden administration could fail in the next couple of months because it was unable to pass anything or do anything because it has this thready bare majority, like like a majority by a hair's breadth, kind of. Um, and and that's that's a world in which it's really hard to do stuff. Uh, now, on the other hand, I lived in Barcelona for nine months a long time ago, and Barcelona had sort of two governing bodies which were opposite politically. And uh, several people commented to me that the fact that these, these two government bodies were kind of against each other was really pr- sort of fruitful for Catalonia because they weren't like doing too much to destroy the area. Like if, if they had been aligned and, and had too much power, they, they might've like run the table in some sense. So all of that gets into policy discussions that are above my pay grade, but I'm trying to figure out how do we get beyond national governments? How do we get humans collaborating? on local scales? How do we get people, you know, standing up and causing large scale change? How do we help that happen? So, so part of my intention is to, is to help us act on a very large scale together. And I, I realize that 
like way ambitious or overly optimistic for what we could do. But, um, but I'm, but I think everybody who cares about the future has a different theory about a theory of the world, a theory of change about how these things tip. And, and mine focuses an awful lot on trust, which is not a topic we focused a lot on in OGM. We've been geeking a lot. We've been focusing a lot on the shared memory. And, and for me, a, a visible, palpable, shared memory, actually shared memory of what we're seeing go by and what we think about it is really important for building trust. So, so for me, that's a mechanism not just to memorialize stuff, it's actually a mechanism to get to trust. Uh, but we're busy on like, hey, should it be Markdown or some, some other format is a different conversation from how are we vulnerable and how do we meet the other, right? Yeah. Those are completely different parts of the same general mission. Um, and I would love for the guests and the, and the themes of the episodes in Weaving the World to wander that space. So I would love to mix a geeky episode with three non-geeky episodes um, and I certainly don't want, I don't, I don't want weaving the world to become free jury's brain calls. That's like, like not, not a goal here. Um, we want to go, go, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but. Well, you're doing a good job. Other thoughts? Does this trigger any other, any other connections or ideas about impact and what to do? And Stacy, how do you envision measuring the connections made? Do you uh, uh, like self-reporting? If so, collected and visualized. Where do you have do you have more well, think, more texture think, on it? Oh, I think part of the whole reason for even thinking of that is that it might bring in other people that have their own vested, like somebody like Sam who's working on collaborology. It might bring somebody like that that sees something to this project that adds another piece to it. And again, I'm only, I mean, when you talk about trust, I look at trust a little bit differently because I will only go into a space where I'm already trusting the people. And then as it grows, I don't have to be as concerned about it because I know the core has been trustworthy. So right. like this group to me is a trustworthy group. I spend a lot of time in GCC calls. They're a trustworthy group. There are other places I don't go for that reason, because it has to have a strong core. I kind of alluded uh, to Bentley about that once. Um, I don't know if you picked up on that's what I was saying, but um, so that part comes naturally because I mean, hopefully we're not gonna pick some guest who's just a horrible person and highlight that person. Well, we may pick, we, I, we're, I, I think we need to mature and be secure enough and strong enough to get to the point to invite some relatively horrible people whose ideas we disagree with sharply and to hold that space in a way that works. And I'm not entirely sure what all that means, but. Okay, but, so here, here's what I just want. I, I just want to make a distinction. Yeah. Trust doesn't mean that I agree with the person. Yeah. Trust means that they're intellectually honest when they're having a disagreement. Yes, and and that they a, don't personally attack, personally it's, attack. It's a, it's a, it's an emotional, um, it's an emotional IQ position, in a sense. I know the, the problem is that the way that trust is being weaponized on purpose right now, directly goes into those things you just want to avoid as tactics, like uh, personalizing the attacks, uh, being intellectually dishonest like denying facts, undermining science, post-truth, all that kind of stuff. Like, like all of that is a kind of intellectual dishonesty. Uh, there's another version of it all, which is like, oh, I, I just, when I look at the same set of data and facts, I derive different conclusions than you do, which, which is more, a more intellectually honest way of going about it. And that, that's super interesting. But I think that the boundary between those two things is really, really thin because, because the, the alt-right, the far-right has figured out that undermining the very things that you that, that you just described is key to winning elections and like steamrolling the world, and and so so I'm trying to figure out where is the how how close to that edge can we work, and we're not anywhere near close to that edge right now. We're not we're not in those conversations. Well, somebody that does it really well is Russell Brand, 
He's yeah. really good at, yeah. at that. Um, but you bring up another point um, that goes towards maybe the way we look at some of this. One of the things that the right does really well is they build off of each other. So there'll be one story and every other media, you know, every other partner, I think maybe we should look to do that because interestingly enough, as I've been thinking about what do I think are good ideas, all of a sudden I'll say, oh, Jim Rutt did that podcast. That's good. That person was here. And rather than, I think sometimes people that are more, um, what's the word? Less, you know, not, people like us <laughs> tend to shy away from either repeating or we don't want to infringe upon what somebody else is doing. And I think we have to change that and see it as we're amplifying what they're doing and we're adding and we're making it stronger as opposed to we're trying to infringe or take away, if that makes any sense. Um, actually, uh, it does. And uh, from, from my perspective, uh, let me just show you, a, show you a thought in my brain that's been in my brain for quite a while. Um, so conservatives nurtured an ecosystem of blogs, Twitter accounts, actually I should add AM radio, talk radio. Um, uh, basically, uh, you can't drive across this country listening to radio without being inundated by conservative voices and talk radio. And there's a reason for that. There's, there's like a really systematic strategic reason for that particular fact. Uh, and so you can kind of go through this, and part of, part of my understanding of the far right's strategy, and in, in the middle right too, like normal conservatives started this back in the 60s, uh, but, but part of the strategy was, hey, we need to own this conversational space, and we need to do message management so that when something starts somewhere, we can, we can cause the left to have to talk about it by bouncing it up and down in this echo chamber, right? And, 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 and once it starts gathering volume, then the left is, uh, you know, CNN is, is a miss if they don't actually report on this thing that we just drummed up and started, you know, critical race theory is being taught everywhere in our schools is being forced on everybody's throats. Actually, it's not, it's an obscure discipline that nobody's forcing down anybody's throat. But hey, once you echo that through the system loud enough, it suddenly becomes a thing that people can get incensed about and go scream at and threaten their school board about which is happening. We're just watching that being lit on fire completely intentionally and with great success, right? We're like public officials who are not being paid much or anything for some of these positions are being driven out of office because they don't want threats on their life. You know, we know where you live. We're going to come get you is not a thing you want to do. That's not why you signed up for the school board. Right. So, so that's, that's busy happening. And, um, and I think the progressive side does reference itself, but doesn't build the same kind of energy because it's not involved in the same intentional strategies. And then on the left, on the progressive side, there are movement makers like Jeremy Hyman's who, who started purpose.org uh, and, and a bunch of other people who are trying to figure out how, the, how these dynamics work, right? Um, and I'm not sure that the left knows nearly as well as the right how these dynamics work. Um, one of the other pieces of my sort of skeptical observation on the right, uh, do you guys know about the OODA loop? No. Um, so, so let me just go to the OODA loop in my brain for a sec. Let me just screen share real, real quick. This is, um, so the OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, act. It comes from uh, uh, an Air Force colonel named John Boyd, who was a real maverick, a real brilliant, brilliant, crazy guy, who was the kind of guy he would, you know, he would call his, his subordinates at 2 a.m. and say, I just had a great idea. We got to do this. We got to do this. Uh, and and uh, he did a lot of really good things, one of which was inventing this thing, which is meant for dogfights. So observe what are the immediate facts at hand. Uh, we're over North Korea. I'm in a Sabre. He's in a MiG-17. Uh, uh, he's got 2,000 feet on me, we're climbing. Uh, uh, Orient, uh, what else can you infer from those facts? Uh, he's he's a, probably a North Korean pilot trained by the, the, the Russians. His airplane can outclimb and outshoot me, but not outdive and outturn me. Uh, the side is, I better turn and get out of here, and then act is pull the joystick faster. And Boyd's claim is, whoever runs through this loop faster wins uh, the dogfight. And he invented this for dogfights, but 
um, in the acknowledgement section of the biography of Dick uh, of John Boyd, um, uh, the author credits Dick Cheney, who was a huge fan of Boyd and was a Secretary of Defense under Ford, right? So uh, here's Coram thanks Cheney for all his help in the biography of Boyd, and this is in my brain because I think this is actually really important. And then I say conservatives have applied psychology and sociology and all those things much better than liberals have, because these observations, the OODA loop, is how John Kerry did not become president of the United States. And we got Bush instead with some hanging chads, mm -hmm. right? Is that if you remember swift boating and flip-flopping and so like Kerry had no understanding. <laughs> Kerry had no ability to respond to those things because, yeah. um, because the far right was busy arming this, this, this weapon. The, the far right understood how to weaponize communications between the echo chamber and the OODA loop. So, so the OODA loop is a, is, a, is a strategy that you feed into the echo chamber. And it took them 30 years to build the echo chamber. But once you've got a highly functioning echo chamber, then you start feeding it ammo. And the ammo can be as bizarre and as crazy ass as you want. And if, if your people are on fire, they're on fire. They'll take anything you feed them. And, it, and this thing actually really, really works. And I'm trying to figure out how do you throw a blanket over it? How do we suppress the fires with listening with, with, with care and love? Uh, vulnerability, uh, contrary facts don't usually help. Uh, it, it, so all these different sorts of insights are showing up in the public sphere. And I'm, I'm desperately interested in what dampens this insane uh, effort to you know, light us all on fire. And it, it's, it's quite intentional. And it's quite, and it's very strategic and it's very well thought through from a, hey, how do human minds work? How do human crowds work? Um, how do we do this? It's really nicely thought through there. And I don't think that the appropriate countermeasure is to adopt the same tactics, right? But I don't think anybody's figured out yet what the appropriate countermeasures are. The closest I can get is uh, Stacey Abrams saying, slow down the canvassing and let's actually slow down and have conversations. And that's just like a bare bones, tiny little start. But deep canvassing is, is the name of let's go slower when we actually knock door to door, because just knocking saying, here's a pamphlet and leaving does nothing, just irritates the people you just got up off the couch. Right. But actually sitting down and listening to them with respect, that actually might get somewhere. Even better, yeah. having a dinner, you know. Dinners for six with people who have different ideas. Brilliant idea. Don't know. What then, made you? What made you say I was just talking about that? The, it, it, oh, did I say no? You I didn't. didn't you did not. But I think it's a really great tactic. Well, I was well, I was talking to somebody else about my list that I started. I, that I mentioned to you guys. That was like the next one on the list. Something that I had learned from my rabbi when he was doing community organizing, and I, that's a great. Thing to do. And I had told Hank in a call once that I wanted to have virtual dinner parties for yeah. six. <laughs> and we could have episodes of Weaving the World that are dinner parties. You know, I, I, I'd, love for, I'd love to play with the format and, and, and what we're doing and how we go about it. It'd be really awesome. Let me ask you a different question because yeah. the other day you showed me on your map uh, contrarians who make Mix. sense. Yes. And the question that I wanted to ask you is in, in your list, are they, are they from both sides or was it like, I just wasn't sure? Um, mostly there are people whose opinions and insights I appreciate and value. So um, some of them are just not um, political at all. Some of them are, you know, don't have a politics necessarily, but here's the thought. So contrarians who make or made sense. I'll, I'll put a shortcut to this thought in the chat right now. Um, um, I mean, probably these lean progressive in different ways. I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm looking down the list. Joel Salatin is pretty religious and might be conservative. Don't know exactly. Uh, he's the, the, the head of Polyface Farms and he is, his thing is natural farming, basically, um, you know, rotating, rotating crops and animals on the earth, et cetera, et cetera. That, uh, that's interesting. And this sort of feeds back into the whole ecosystem of what we're now calling regenerative agriculture and so forth. Um, I don't know how many of these people you might consider conservatives. Not a lot. That's, so that's the reason that I'm asking you is because when you're talking about trust, yeah. um, or even when, like when you bring up Stacey Abrams, that whole thing about 
you know, really getting to know somebody. So what I tend to do is if I'm in a conservative Facebook group or whatever, is I look for the person that at least makes sense and can have an intellectually honest disagreement. Yep. And then you then you can find like common ground, you can find ways to move. And it is not the approach that we were talking about that the right uses. And I think that's the way to do it. So that's why when I said, you know, when I said it has something to do with an emotional makeup, that's what I'm talking about. Finding somebody that you don't agree with, but if politics were kept out of it and you knew nothing about their politics, you'd actually like them. Right. You'd enjoy mm-hmm. a dinner, you'd enjoy yeah. a dinner conversation. I, I exactly. totally agree. I totally agree with that. And that's what I meant when I said, we're not going to have the bad people on. We're not going to have somebody that we wouldn't even want to have a beer with. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Bentley Hank, any thoughts on this? Totally agreed. Uh, sometimes you guess wrong. But I mean, that's part of the learning process. And I think if you try to communicate on the basis of what people really want out of life or for their children or for their grandchildren uh, or what they, something I I used to do quite a lot, uh, I had this uh, five generations uh, or hundred years uh, exercise where you ask people, what did you learn from your father, or your grandfather that made you choose your present profession or your present value set? And you have this type of conversation with people. Uh, lots of people can discover that they learned the same things from grandparents or want the same things for grandchildren, only they express them in different ways. And that's an interesting start for a dialogue. Yep. Agreed. Uh, Bentley? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I agree um, with uh, Stacy's uh, points and thrust. Um, there might be times I have conversations with people that are intellectually honest, but I wouldn't want to have a beer with, but, but in general, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Part of my project is reaching out to your worst enemy and finding a way to communicate, but that's a different thing than this. Um, yep. So yeah, so I think that's all good. Um, if I can then kind of, I don't know how long you have slated for this meeting, Jerry, we'll kind of get- um, I was thinking we were at the top of the hour and probably near done, um, but I'm happy to hang out and keep, if there's a fruitful vein you'd like to follow, I'm happy to stay on. I guess uh, what I'd like to do is say, you know, I, I think probably the, the first, the thing to kind of keep moving. I think that we have a lot of people attending these calls that are very generative um, and not very narrowing, right? So uh, I- you know, Including I me, by the way. Maybe, maybe, maybe particularly is... me. <laughs> <laughs> guilty, guilty, yeah, guilty, yeah. guilty. So we're generating a lot of great ideas that are, you know, be perfect for six months from now. Um, uh, so I, yeah, maybe uh, we could talk more about that kind of producer role who would be kind of in charge of it at times, narrowing us down and doing that. And I, you know, I'm kind of available to do that. Well, let me say, if I can eke out some funds from it, then I can be available for it. But okay. anytime I'm working on that, I'm taking it away from, you know, my other project. So yeah. I need to like make it at least self-sustainable. Um, but I don't know if you're, if you're ready for that project. So that's a conversation I think either you and I had need to have or we can have at the next meeting. If I, but I'm also not the best at that. I mean, I've managed projects and I've, I've done all that, uh, but there are better people than me. They just may not be available for this one at the yeah. time. And there's a couple, there's a couple people sort of swirling in this conversation who um, have lots of project management experience and ops experience. I just don't know that they want to be the producers of this show, um, but they're interested in offering some of their chops to OGM broadly or weaving the world or something like that. And I haven't had that conversation with them, 
so that's that's one thing is there's there's several people who've got this kind of skill who are you know in conversation and then the second thing is that some of the funds that the rut foundation just gave us to to build this show with are for video production audio production whatever else um so so there there are some yeah. funds in there uh, and also some of them are to build a couple tiles of basically code that need to be uh, that needs to be generated uh, as part of this. Uh, and so I was talking yesterday with Pete about one of the tiles for for automating some of the production for for what happens. Um, so that I think that'll I think all these things can flow together and we can figure this out. And I think I think a piece of this first two month uh, project piece is to figure out how to get more funds, not just with the Rudd Foundation, but with other other places. And, you know, uh, one of the things that I need to do is go go ask other uh, other folks for for funding, at least interim funding until we figure out other forms of, of floating our entity. Then you know, one of my side weird dreams is that we could sell NFTs of snapshots of our process because I look at the world of NFTs and pretty much every digital object is a nonsense object. A few of them are pretty. But they're all pretty much nonsense objects. They're being sold as collectibles because they're unique and stamped with a you know with 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 NFT ness. Um, and I I think that a, a market of actually meaningful NFTs. This is what the world looked like at this moment in our journey to try to fix shit that matters. Uh, might might actually be interesting. And it's beyond my pay grade to sort of go do. But I know that Pete's been experimenting, and a bunch of other people are experimenting with that. And if that and if, and if the fifth sale of an NFT funneled 10% of that transaction back into our community, and that turned out to be a lot of money, we're good. We actually then don't need to appeal to anybody for, for, for grant funding. We're then self-sufficient, right? One of the lovely things about NFTs is, is that most of them include a percentage of, sub, of, of uh, subsequent sales back to the originator. That's, that, that one thing to me is gold. It's really magical. So. So maybe we spend yeah. a piece of our effort on something like that. I don't know. I'm I'm really interested in yeah. that. Yeah. And and, and like the, and and the first part of the conversation here about artwork, you know, artwork connected to a brain snapshot connected to a conversational snippet made into a collage artifact and then put in, you know, offered as a, as an NFT might in fact be appealing to some people. Sorry Bentley, I talked over you. I was just thinking the other thing. I think they they need to try an NFT where you're renting it instead of buying it and trading it. Where in order to, to be the owner, you you have to put in more continuously. But that's me. Interesting. Uh, yeah. 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 So so yeah, maybe we need to figure out that and and what like some sort form of compensation could also be just like i'm tracking my hours and there's no guarantee you know we've talked about that before there's no guarantee yeah. that there'll ever be a payout but um but we do need to kind of i think having that that little donation which probably isn't enough to produce the first show i think you need to put some thinking around on that on on how much is that just reserved for people we can't get to volunteer or put in sweat equity yeah is there a simple hour tracking system we could institute just to start doing that? Uh, I use Toggle, which I think its free version is pretty good, T-O-G-G-L-E. Um, but you might float it with other people that might want to participate. So like Pete. Um, cool. uh, although That's you could also just do an Airtable sheet and have people put in a number of hours and kind of what they were working on. And yeah. Their name. yeah. That may be that people may not like having to download Toggle. Right. Can and I, it's kind of like on off. I use it because I can't remember. I don't have something. Yeah. Go ahead, Stacey. Well, I was just going to ask if you even have a budget formulated. I don't mean specific, but if you've even written down how much is going to be allot allotted towards this, that, and the other thing. Because I, that's a, this was a, this was a disagreement I had in my marriage all the time. You need to start with a budget. Not, you know, you need to at least divide it into categories. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a line item in the document we're staring at that says budget, but there isn't much behind that at this point. Um, there, so I have kind of a starting quote from uh, Jim Rutt's uh, producer, who I had a nice conversation with, and we talked about sort of gear and other sorts of stuff. And he offered sort of hourly rates for, for helping. 
uh, so he's so he's available, but he's not a he's not a booker or a show producer. He's more no, just but, like the the mechanics of producing the videos. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not talking about budget going out. I'm talking about just looking at it and saying this much is being reserved for this. This much is being reserved for that. Um, not even how it's going to get broken up. Yeah, yeah. At, at this point, rough. Yeah only rough yeah yeah so like is it a third <laughs> one for the show one third for uh, the show one third for the so so the, the rough foundation has sent over twenty five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars of which is for me and then 15 is for um production help uh and and the tiles okay and that's so, the rough yeah so just a little a ballpark then would be to think is that Five thousand per tile, and then five for the show, or is it? You know, that's roughly just, what just my, that's like. <clears throat> that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good starting point. Yeah, like yeah. That's, now you know that's, you have. Probably throw that under the budget. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of the the framing I've got around it right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I probably do need to head out. We, uh, but yeah, so a little bit more discussion on the budget next would might be would be my suggested okay. agenda item. Good and I, I, and let's go to the let's go to the Mattermost channel and and work together there. I think because there's yeah, lots of definitely. lots of stuff I need to sort out fast so that we stand up some shows soon, <clears throat> okay. um, including I need to propose schedules and stuff like that. Um, should there be a standing hour like we have standing calls like this one uh, every week? Should there be a standing hour for the show, or should I just book each episode when the guest is available? Just some wherever it falls in the week that they're available, that I'm available, and whoever else is participating on the call is available. Should that yeah. should it be more more pop up nature, or should there be a like a schedule? I like the pop up nature to tell you the truth. Then, uh, if it's really good, people will shove other things in their schedules aside. Uh, if you've got a deadline of first uh, Wednesday of the month then you're getting into all sorts of stress for uh, will we have a really good show? But that's yeah. just the first impression. And also on the pro side for pop-up <clears throat> is that it makes it much easier to schedule with, with guests because you don't have to wait until they're free yeah. at, your, at your designated hour. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the con side, some people just love to have a, a time that they can set every week that they show Ooh. up for stuff. But we're moving away from, from uh, scheduled programming. We're moving away from you know, must see TV into a world of, hey, you, you know, you, we drop a whole season on a day and you eat it when you want to eat it. Uh, Jerry, do you have a Calendly or a schedule, you know, a scheduler? System? I've not, got, I've not gone to Calendly. I'm on the cusp of doing so, but, you know, budget basically. Um, so, yeah, I would suggest probably should spend some of that money on, because it's painful to sit with a potential, but I, I've seen people are fine if you send them a link that they can do it at their own time. Find yeah, yeah. Like. And I'm not even sure I'd suggest Calendly at this point. I'm using them. I'm on their free tier, actually. Uh -huh. um, there's a Savvy Cow, but that one doesn't have a free tier, I don't think. Um, that's the one I'd probably suggest if I was paying. Really? OK. So those are the two options, so I'd say. Don't think I've heard of them. Have you decided how long the show each show is going to be? Is it going to be a set time? I'm thinking they're 90 minute episodes, um, but I'm not sure. I'm totally open to, to, but part of it is that I've done lots and lots of conversations like these now. And I just, I, I, I find that at the 50 minute mark, they're just getting warm and juicy. And like, like we're really starting to hit our stride mm -hmm. and, and ending, ending then at the 60 minute mark or 55 minute mark is like cuts off something that you mm -hmm. know is right there. Yep. And then, and then at the 90 minute mark, people are starting to get a little exhausted of the, of the focus and attention. And it, you know, it's, it's good to sort of wrap things there. And usually, usually things can wrap by 90 minutes. Um, that said, when I go and see 90 minute podcast episodes, I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's long. How am I going to listen to all that? But then a piece of what I think we want to do is digest and reprocess and post-process a lot of these calls so that you could find your way to the 15 minutes you think you're going to like. I think that that will, I think if we do that right, that will, that will make our longer podcasts actually very amenable to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, grazing. And yeah, so I'd, so I'd say 90 minute recording and it probably would be 30 to 60 edited. Um, yeah. Depending yeah. how much editing down there is, yes. 
Um, and at, at the beginning, I don't expect to edit down that much. Uh, as we as we move in, we might actually edit a lot. I don't know. We might actually create create four different objects from one call. I I, I don't know. But yeah. but at the beginning, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna put front matter, but you know, intro outro on the episodes, clip out whatever things were obviously bad, but not do a tremendous amount of editing because also um, the you know video editing is really time consumptive. And so I'm just I'm just at the beginning going with the raw bumpy feel. So I was just thinking about like some of like the late night entertainment shows, how they start off with a particular type of segment, move on to another type of segment, and then you know, and that would help in terms of people coming and get getting what they want. Exactly. And we kind of need to create our own vocabulary and rituals, which is partly why a piece of the conversation I want to have here is what do we call the shadow show? Is it the shadow show? Is it the post show? Is it the, the fungus, the fungus uh, segment? Is, like, like, what do we call the post-processing part where we're not trying to dig up new, new ground, but we're trying to follow the threads of what happened during a particular episode, right? Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure yet, uh, but I think that's a piece of our ritual. Uh, and, and other aspects may well be um, checking in on people to see what new connections were made or other sorts of things. We may bake that into the normal closing process for a call, for example. Don't know, uh, open to all that. Okay, and just to be cool. clear, yeah. I, I am here to volunteer and to assist in any way with the future hope that if something happens and I learn, you know, I'm a part of it, but I love assisting. Awesome, so. thanks Stacey, that's great. And yeah, thank you all. This has been really, really helpful even as we broaden what we're doing. So I've been <laughs> keeping a, a running uh, 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 note-taking in the document. So when you have a look at it, you might want to consolidate things or shift them around. But I've been trying to write down the various things that uh, have been said in the right place and uh, still keeping a, a, a bit open so that as questions arise that haven't been answered yet, uh, we can answer them. That sounds great. Thank you, Hank. I appreciate it. Okay. Sweet. Thanks, everybody. Let's yep. be careful out there. So they say. Yeah. That was always the closing of Hill Street Blues. Yeah. Those good old days. <laughs>